first ministry from way back when. It just touches my heart. I just want to just make this the last prayer. Just to let him know that all this world has to offer and all the things that are going on. And he's the greatest. The knowledge of God is the greatest gift, the greatest miracle that can ever occur is to give one's heart to Jesus and receive the salvation by faith. And the blood of the Lamb and what he did on the cross for us. As we celebrate that, that incredible sacrament today, God, I just want to say, knowing you, Lord God, there is nothing else. There's no greater thing. So come by your spirit and draw us there. And that is, I don't want any scripture showing up here. 
I heard a no. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is that um, I know that all of us believe that we are in a battle, that we are in a spiritual battle. We are from the moment we give our life to Christ and even before that. All of history, from the moment God breathed life into human beings, the battle raged. And so we, we sing about, we talk about, we seek things, and oftentimes we're not even in anywhere close to this weapon. Okay? We need to be comfortable with this weapon. We need to wield this weapon. And we need to be exercised in this weapon. We need to kind of dance around in it, so to speak. And so I'm, I've asked the fellows not to show scripture up there today. And that, that, is, that is an encouragement to you all. And that encouragement is when you go to battle, bring your with God, then we can get self-righteous and a hardened heart. If we look at what it is that God has done in our life, that He's created us and knitted us together and put into our soul a desire to know Him, that's the passionate God that says, here's a little clear key. I hope you find it. I hope you can tap into it. I hope you can realize how much I want you to know me and realize who I am. Search my thoughts, oh God. Search me deep. Search me deep. I'm gonna, I told uh, Judy I was going to do this. I'll be right back. Those of you who are watching, please, I'll be back. I wasn't going to use this, but I saw it back in the back in the hallway, so I thought I'm going to do this. Tilling the heart can be hard business. It's like this. Sometimes the heart gets hard. And we think, well, I think I'll just dig a little bit. Now, that's enough, God. I, I see that sin. I see that problem. I see the distance between me and you. But then he says, why don't you dig a little bit deeper? Oh, I, I don't know if I want to go that deep. Because I might see something there that I know and that he already knows, but what he wants me to do is dig it up, get the root out, and cast it away. Where real healing begins. Where real joy takes deep root in our heart. Because we are now no longer, not separated so much, but blocked from the joy that comes when we confess our sin to, to him. Let's turn to 1 Peter. This is where this is another piece that is uh, uh, pretty phenomenal in terms of uh, you and I have a chance to experience and know deeper and deeper as we search His Word, as we fellowship and as we worship and so forth. We experience things that the angels long to see and experience. What? We get to experience that. In 1 Peter, I'm going to start in verse 3, chapter 1. This is an, an incredible part of that inner part of the, of the sandwich. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wow! I mean, this is, this is monstrous mayonnaise and relish and lettuce and onions and more and more to a salad. This, when we read this, the God who created everything, the God who crawled on that cross for you and I, who knit us together, gives us this kind of gift. Freely He gives. All we have to do is choose. One, to give our life to Him, and then each and every day thereafter continue to say, God, help me. Here's my sin. It's yours. And let Him take it away. And then it's, it's, uh, he, he goes on and he talks a little bit more. I'm going to read verse 8. And though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And though you do not see Him now, but will believe, but believe in Him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And he talks about the prophets, that they prophesied the grace of, God, of the gospel message, not for themselves, but for you and I. For those who gather in Lewis and Idaho or any other place and open up their word, this is what he wants us to understand. That incredible, imperishable, undefiled gift of life everlasting. And then the last, verse 12. 
I'm just going to read the, I'll have to read the whole thing. It was revealed to them, the prophets, that they were not serving themselves, but you. In these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things into which angels long to look. Angels long to know and look at what you and I know and sometimes take for granted. And that is a loving, incredible relationship with Jesus Christ. That's phenomenal. That angels long to see what you guys know. Angels want to know all of that stuff and they're not privy to it. We are. That's incredibly powerful to me to think about. It is important that we see this as, a, as an aspect of that sandwich. Look back, absolutely. Look forward, for sure. But don't forget this deep, deep, beautiful ocean filled with lots of incredible truths about how much He loves us. We cannot know it unless we're in it. How much joy comes with knowing that sometimes it's not so much joy as much as it is conviction. As he says, here's a word for you, Bill, that you didn't know I was going to give you. And it's something about how you're living. You better listen to it. I don't want to hear it. Okay. So we have this opportunity to gaze upon that which, to experience in a deeper way those things in which the angels long for. That they long for these things. Wow, man. That's pretty incredible. So as we do this, as we look back, contemplate and not let a train go flying by without ever really contemplating the incredible gift and sacrifice that our God endured on that cross to deep dive deep into the Word of God to discover the incredible truth that comes when we dive into His Word that we discover that inheritance that is imperishable and undefiled the gift that allows us now to look forward so looking forward, Hebrews chapter 4. Back just a few pages, it's Hebrews chapter 4. So we have, we have one piece of bread. We've got some stuff in the middle now. Lots of really incredible uh, condiments and, and added things. So I'm not just eating a bologna sandwich with mustard on it, which is still an okay sandwich. But I'm eating a monstrous sandwich that is like a... Uh, I, I said I wasn't going to say this, but I'm say it. It's like the difference between... A 99 cent burger at McDonald's and an Effie's burger. Okay. Effie's burgers are too good. I, didn't, I wasn't going to say Effie's burger, but I couldn't resist. So we're going to look forward. Hebrews 4 14. Since then, all these things that we've just been reading about, that imperishable inheritance, that undefiled gift. Since then, we have a great high priest, that is Jesus Christ. Who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Let us hang on tight. Let us hold on to it. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all the things that we are, yet without sin. God has been tempted. Our Savior, when He walked this planet, was tempted just like you are. Don't forget that. That our God, who now is on the throne would experience the temptations just like you and I do. It tells us that right here. His truth tells us that, man, he wrestles with that. He wrestled with that. He faced that. Absolutely. But he was without sin. Unblemished. Because of that, verse 16, let us therefore draw near with confidence to the great throne of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. When we get on our knees, we're usually in need. Don't hold back. Because he already knows it's there. But what he wants us to do is not just be on our knees, but to crawl up on his lap. To crawl up on his lap. When my, my brother was passing away, who uh, was angry at God, and I want to just say this, that uh, Jennifer and I watched a movie called Spotlight last night. I finished it after. Spotlight is a true story about the Boston Globe that investigated the Catholic Church in Boston and the incredible amount of hypocrisy that took place with all the sexual abuse. One city, 
one city, thousands and thousands of young people who were sexually abused by people who were supposed to represent God. Woe to you, Pharisees and scribes and hypocrites. And that's just one city. That went on for generations. Generations. My brother, unfortunately, was one of those. And he died really, really angry at God. Now, I mean, he, he was angry at God as he was getting close to death. And I got down there just in time that he had drifted into kind of a semi-comatose. When I, if you've been with, uh, eh, not, never mind. My brothers used to tease the heck out of me. They were 11 and 13 years older than me. They used to grab me and dump, put me upside down and dump my head in the toilet and flush it. Okay? So when I was with him, uh, and he couldn't move, I leaned into him and I said, you're in a fine position for me to dump your head in the toilet. And I knew that he knew he could, I knew he could hear me because there was just a small smile. It wasn't much, but I saw his lips smile. And I knew he heard me. For the next day and a half before he passed away, I was leaning on his head, talking to him about crawling up on God's lap and being angry. Let the anger go, brother. Let the anger go and let God love you and heal you and, and, and discover who Jesus Christ is. We, we talked and I know he heard me. I don't know if he did it. I knew he heard it. Because even in that moment, in an instant when somebody who doesn't know God in that moment in which they they maybe are in a car accident or they die, and in that moment, because as a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day, that moment's a long period of time for our God. Because He wants nobody to perish without Him. There's always that hope in that moment, that instant like that, in which our God, who loves us, also loves. I'm going to say Jeffrey Dahmer. Can you believe that? That is radical love, reckless love that the song says. And if it happened, Jeffrey Dahmer is going to be in heaven. If he truly, truly gave his life to Christ, which is what we've heard, he'd be sitting beside us. Oh, are you kidding me? That's a God who loves unconditionally, who wants nobody to perish. That is incredible to think about. And our sin is every bit as horrendous to our God as what Jeffrey Dahmer did. Every sin. That's why it's important that we get it out of the way. We confess it. We say, God, this is us. This is me. Therefore, draw near with confidence to the to the throne of Christ. We, get, we can approach Him with confidence because of who Jesus is and His advocacy for us. Let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 10. Just a couple pages down. Another confirmation of what we are called to do. Okay? Richness of, of, the, of the assurance of God's word and his truth. Verse 19 of chapter 10 of Hebrews. Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us again draw near with a sincere heart. That word sincere heart is to approach him without blemish, without cracks in it. In other words, let that shovel dig down deep and discover what the root is, move it around and explore it. It comes from the idea that when, when farmers used to have eggs, they would look and pull it up into a, a bright light like this. I can't remember what the word is called, sinceri or something like that. And they hold that thing up like that and they're looking for flaws. They're looking for flaws in the egg that doesn't go to the marketplace. When he says, go Enter or, or approach the throne with a with confidence, with a sincere heart. It means be okay with opening up to God. He knows it's there already. He knows what Bill's sins are already. All he wants is for me to crawl up on his lap and say, Papa, I'm so sorry. Here it is. Help me to turn away and walk away. With a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast again the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. 
And let us consider how to stimulate or encourage one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembly together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as we see the day drawing near. We are to be involved in our relationship with Christ. I can't know Jennifer over the last 30, what are we entered into, maybe 37? Something. I love it when my wife doesn't know the exact date, too. That helps us. I couldn't have known her the way I do, and she couldn't have known me the way she does without us getting to know one another, without us opening up. We get to know our God absolutely with fellowship and with worship, but we get to know our God with this, the deep truths and love that he has for us so that we can know the incredible truth that is we, have, we can enter the throne room of God with confidence. Why? Because his blood and his death ripped the veil of the heart so that we have direct access to God. Why? Because God wants that. Our God wants us directly accessible. Um, in Luke chapter 22, you can go there if you'd like to, but verse 14 and 15, it's, 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 the, it's the Last Supper. Okay? And in this particular passage, he is, Jesus is going to tell his disciples that, I have longed to share this meal with you. I have longed to share this meal for you because after tonight, I will go home. And it will be another time in which we celebrate and have this communion with him. What he wants to share. Why? Because it's deep fellowship. After, uh, after the resurrection, after Jesus had, had died and, and was buried and then he was resurrected, the disciples, man, they were lost. They were lost, running scared. And they went fishing. Why? So they could normalize it. They could normalize it. So they were out fishing. They didn't get anything. They come back to getting close to the shore, and they see this figure over on the beach, and there's a fire there. And one of the disciples, I think it's John, says, It's the Lord. And it's Peter who says, Let's go! He jumps in and swims a hundred yards, it says, to get there. Peter, the one who denied him. Last week I said, I asked you this, Aren't you glad that I am not God? Because God, Bill Hain, has a God with a sitch. You turn you away from me, buddy. I don't know that I want to sit down and have a, have, a, have a lunch with you right now. You turned against me. You denied me. But Jesus says, let's have a small meal. And Peter, I love you. Man, the only God can do, only a, only a divine, incredibly loving God could do that. Chris and I last week were talking about the, the great story that is the road to Emmaus. Okay? The road to Emmaus is where two disciples are wandering, going back to their home. Why? Because Jesus came, He died. We've heard stories about Him being resurrected. We haven't seen Him. We're bummed because we, we thought He was sure going to set us free. They're walking along and they're getting close to their place and then Jesus comes up and they don't recognize Him. What are you guys talking about? And they're, 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 they're uh, astounded. What? Are you the only idiot who's not heard what's going on in town? We're talking to Jesus. They don't even know it yet. And he goes on with them, and, and, they, and, and Jesus teaches them. He teaches them about himself. And they get to their home. And Jesus doesn't force his way into their home. He waits for them to invite him in. And they invite him in. And they sit down, and they get ready to eat. And this is the, the part about communion that's, that's so important as well as opening up His Word, that we, will, we in, in, interact with His Word, the living Word. But when Jesus took the bread and He broke it, what happened? All of a sudden, those disciples looked and said, it's the Lord. All of a sudden, they could see Him. They broke the bread and said, here, look what's inside the sandwich, man, it's me. And they saw Him, and in a moment, He was gone. That's all that they needed. In a moment, Jesus can turn us. Are we willing to open that up? Are we willing to take out a shovel and dig up the stuff? Are we willing to do that? To make that sandwich incredibly great. Our God loves us. and He longs to have us celebrate communion together. We look back. 
we look forward to what we have coming in. But we also need to make sure we take the time to really do this and do that. To deepen that love affair, to deepen the understanding of our God. And it's beyond understanding, as we read in Scripture today. It's beyond what I can ever understand and fathom. But what we can begin to do is truly begin to know more and more about how much our God loves us and the kind of joy that awaits us the more we dive into this thing, the more we work with it and manage it and we play around with it. What we do know is this, as we get ready to have communion, that Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took that bread and he looked forward to the, to, to the year 2020 when Bill Hain would fall short of the glory of God and fall, fall in, in his way. And he still broke the bread. He still went to the cross. Why? Because we would need it. He knew I would need it. He broke the bread and said, take this. This is my body. A body that will be broken like we read about, like we, like we talked about. A body that will be broken. Broken deeply. And then he took that cup and he said, this is the cup of